Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today for our discussion, our lively discussion about power building. This is the first of three sessions, and we're happy that you've chosen to join us today. Today, we'll talk about making community engagement transformational. As a former organizer myself and change agent for social justice, today's discussion is critical because it's about building power within communities with those that are most affected by issues in service of equity and justice. Today, you can expect to hear a clear definition of power. Uh, also, you will also hear our panelists today acknowledge the differences and the challenges that they've encountered in their power building work. And last but not least, evaluating uh, power building. What should you pay attention to? What should we learn from the, um, a process, a power building strategy process such as this? So at Community Science, we prioritize the advancement of equity and justice. We do this through our work with clients, which include government agencies, nonprofits, and philanthropy by providing quality research evaluation and the organizational capacity building supports that we offer. And today, you, you have me, Jasmine Williams Washington, associate here at Community Science, along with my colleague, uh, David Chavez, and our colleague Dante Cowens, who is in the background and will be supporting us with any technical issues that you all may be experiencing and answer any questions. He will also be monitoring the chat for the Q&A portion of today's discussion. Um, additionally, we have joining us two panelists, um, two of our esteemed panelists. Uh, we have William Rivas, Rivas co-founder of Save Our Streets, and Dr. Jed Oppenheim, Program Director of the Public Welfare Foundation. Before we go into their introductions, I just want to take a moment um, and pause for my colleague, David Chavez, for him to introduce himself. David? Thank you, Jasmine, and I'm glad to uh, be here today. Uh, as uh, as knows, I, we're excited. This has been a big thrust for community science in both working on the strategy and the practice of, uh, of community power shifting, community power building. And I think the theme here is to keep it real and to talk about some of those, uh, what's really happening and some of the challenges we face. My background has been not only working as an evaluator, but also as a strategist and trainer for community organizers. I started my career as a community organizer and um, and first in Buffalo, New York, not too far away from, from Will, and also uh, in Appalachia and in New York City. Um, so I'm really happy to see that there's a coming of age of this, of this work. Um, and so I appreciate being here. So thank you, Jasmine. Thank you. Um, Dante Arias, would you like to bring your voice into the space saying hi and how you're going to support us today? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dante Cowens and I'm a research associate at Community Science. And today I'm just gonna be in the background. If you have any technical issues with like the Zoom, um, please feel free to just message me and um, I'll do my best to assist you. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, and at the request of our panelists, I will do their introductions. So again, we have um, Dr. Jed Oppenheim with the Public Welfare Foundation joining us today. Um, along with William Rivas, co-founder of Save Our Streets. Jed is an advocate, excuse me. Jed is an advocate with close to 15 years experience doing and supporting this type of work. So not only has he done it, he has also funded power building work um, across the Southeast um, and pretty much focusing his, uh, his work in supporting, well, interrupting the school to prison pipeline. And he's also supported other community-led transformative efforts around education, family and economic security and food systems. Prior to joining the world of philanthropy, Jed was the director of community engagement at the local United Way in Jackson, Mississippi. William has over 10 years of experience as a nonprofit executive 
As we are here to discuss power building, William was featured on Matter of Fact TV in December of 2021 with Soledad O'Brien to discuss the nation's first community operated police new hire panel uh, in Schenectady, New York. He did this with not only himself and his experience as a community advocate and organizer and nonprofit professional, but with the community driving this effort. His commitment is to transform, uh, make transform, um, transformational change for Schenectady and its residents within it. William has built the, the power that we're, we're gonna talk more about today, um, and it's gonna make huge impact long-term. So today we have two perspectives. We have the perspective of a funder, someone who's done this work and funded this work, and also been on the other side in, inside of a nonprofit, and someone who has done it and made sustainable change that will have lasting systemic impact for years to come. So why are we here today? We're here to discuss power. What is power? Power, as Dr. Martin Luther King said, he put it very well, power is the ability to achieve a purpose. Whether, it, whether or not it is good or bad, it depends upon the purpose. Ultimately, power is getting what you want. Understanding power is essential to driving change. That's why we're here today. We're here to discuss power building as a vehicle for change, sustainable change, to advance equity, justice, and create a society that better serves everyone. It is imperative we work to shift the imbalance of in existing power structures. However, shifting power can be difficult. We're not here to say it's gonna be a walk in the park. And we'll talk more about those challenges uh, shortly. Much of the time, the existing power dynamics are not always visible, not something you can necessarily see or touch. They are inherent in the communities that we're all working within. But power does not exist in a vacuum. There are different levels to power, different types of power. And David will tell us more about those different types of power. David. Hey, thank you, Jasmine. I appreciate that. And I think, um, one of the things I wanted to clarify up front is that you know, this is not a, a webinar on how to do community organizing, but the question is, is that how, what strategies um, you know, support community organizing in there? Uh, I'm sorry, greater community power building. And so we've identified, and so these are for nonprofits and governments and foundations that really want to support it. What kind of strategies can you employ um, to be able to build community power? Um, so those three strategies are first community control, those strategies where the community is in the leadership of their community leaders, which we'll talk about later, but the importance of knowing that community leaders have members that represent the community and are accountable to them, that are just not somebody that's picked off of the streets that you like their ideas, um, that these are, that, that communities have the say and they have ownership of the process and decision making. Another strategy for, for power building is shared power. Um, once that power is there, we talk about partnerships or relationships with larger institutions where community control the community led um, groups and the leaders sit at the table with, um, um, with other, others to be able to make decisions. So they're part of the decision-making process. They don't own it completely, but they share in that process. And the third strategy is building power, power through leadership and relationships. Many times community groups and gaining greater power, especially those that are traditionally disenfranchised, um, either find themselves being able to move people into elected positions, board positions, commissions, and other, and other positions of greater power, as well as developing relationships to, with um, those powerful institutions so that they can be able to exercise or uh, exercise their power um, in the community. Um, and we will be saying, um, sharing the slides after with all the participants as well as other materials to answer some of the questions that are coming up. So you don't have to take notes. Um, so that, those are three strategies that we are presenting um, uh, as the focus of power, power building. 
community control where there's ownership and, and control and decision making, shared power where a powerful community group and the leadership can share power with other institutions and developing power through leadership and relationships. Yeah. Thank you, David. What you're viewing is the spectrum of community engagement. This spectrum was developed by Rosa Gonzalez of Facilitating Power and is used by government agencies, community-based organizations, and philanthropy to conceptualize community participation. The spectrum draws upon draws from previous tools like Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation. Uh, to maintain things as they are historically. Many populations are excluded from the engagement process. And so if you take a look at this particular spectrum, typically foundations and city government nonprofits stay within the first three levels. Um, the problem with that is that community power is absent there. This, these efforts here in, upon, in this particular part of the spectrum um, stops at the information sharing um, portion, and it's really one way. It is not engaging uh, community members both ways, and there's no accountability. Where's the feedback loop? How are we feeding back to the community what we're learning from them um, inside of this process? When we talk about power and power building, we're focusing on the other side of this particular spectrum, um, portions uh, four and five, and the collaboration and power for impact. David mentioned previously the three components to power here, and we, uh, you have shared power in column four that, that really gets that. So that's the first one. And then the, the, la the further column, the last column, column five, we see that full community control. Why are we focused here when we, when we talk about power? It is here that we see that community is driving this process. We're not in control. When I say we, I'm going to say me, the institution. I am not in control. Community is the driver. Community has decision-making power. And as a result of that and, be, and engaging community and sharing that power with community, there's community buy-in. There's this sense of communi uh, community, collective efficacy. And ultimately, the one thing that we all want to do is make sustainable change. And we know that in order to do that, we need that buy-in. So when we talk about power, we're talking about this end of the spectrum. And I just want to mention that at the conclusion of this series, you will also receive the link to this original, um, this original tool uh, for your reference as well. So now that we are here, and I see some people, some people are already in it. Um, we we want to take a moment and hear from our, our panelists. But now, if you refresh your screen, uh, just a moment, if you're in Mentimeter, what worries you or the leadership of your organization when considering or implementing community power building strategies? And while you all are populating that, I want to turn it over to our panelists, um, Will and Jed, to hear your thoughts on that. Um, Will, would you like to, to share your um, experience? Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, and I, what I would like to say is really, uh, what I found, what was worrisome most to me really was uh, not having enough authentic spaces in which people could have real conversations. And, and I say that because uh, I've, I've been blessed to be involved in a lot of coalitions and meetings and discussions and what I found was, is that a lot of times, unfortunately, it was people just talking. Um, there was little to no activity or follow through with that. So but what I have been blessed to be able to do with, with my family and my friends and the support of my community is, is work diligently to create authentic spaces in which the community can come and share their experiences, their opinions, their expectations without, uh, without it being filtered through uh, agenda or leadership. Um, and that even includes myself in certain spaces because I have an identified voice to certain people um, and removing myself and my voice from the space and allowing others from the community that are most of impacted and affected by the decisions made uh, to, to discuss and to really express their experiences. And what I found is 
uh, we've been able to create these discussions in which people are coming together openly disagreeing and still walking away feeling like their opinion has been heard. And we're starting to see real tangible change in certain prospects of the, product, of the programs and policies that we're working with. So that has been you know, a really good starting point is really just allowing the community to come in, be open, be honest, be authentic, um, because there's a lot of truth that is not always spoken about in these rooms. And when we talk about the community perspective, a lot of the times it's from a leadership capacity and the people who are talking about the community don't always represent the community that they're speaking about. Thank you, Will. Thank you for that. Jed, do you want to share your, your experiences there? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Williams Washington. Thanks Community Science for the invitation. Um, I'll be clear, I'm very new on my uh, new role with the Public Welfare Foundation. So I wanna talk kind of retrospectively about previous experiences. I'm excited about the new role to be able to work on uh, building power, particularly with formerly incarcerated persons around youth and, and adult criminal justice issues. Um, I think one of, the, one of the tensions that we always faced in philanthropy, always face in philanthropy, is um is working as a translator between what our uh strategies are what we're thinking about as we talk about our values of community driven decisions and then funding them and then also what communities are really saying and how to really be authentic with that and so i think about um the tension of uh, uh funders who are saying hey we need to get to these outputs or these outcomes when really what community is saying trust us we'll get there support us how we want to be supported so we'll, we'll get there right if we're working together and if we're being authentic um i, th I think about the way community change uh frames power uh, around narrative resources policy and governance and if we're really talking about getting to a point of liberating communities then i think we're also really talking about um how to move beyond this like very a very task oriented output oriented um that sometimes philanthropy falls into the trap and, and nonprofits because they're they're following the guidance of philanthropy and so um i think those are things to to think about i think it's long-term trust building relationship building and time 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 with the organizations that we're we're serving and really being values driven um i think that's kind of key i think there was always that tension around um well you know it's great we want to support power building, but we also have to get to these outputs. And so how do we work both internally uh, within philanthropy, but also translating externally to say, you know, why we have to think about it this way and how are we strategizing, but also how are we supporting organizations if we're really being true to our values? Thank you for that. And just just to follow up, um, both of you, in essence, mentioned like these relationships and the, the importance of authenticity inside of this process. Um, how do you or how have you navigated um, doing that and also expressing to the leadership of your organization? I know that Will is a co-founder of his organization, so he is the leader, right? But, but when there is a, another entity involved, how do you navigate though that resistance that you may actually come, come up against? Well, for me, the way we navigate this is we're, we're very particular in the way we set up the community conversations as we've discussed in the past. So um, it's intentional about having uh, those most impacted in the room. And it's, it's intentional about even as identifying myself as a leader is being mindful that my voice should not overshadow the voice of the community. So what we've done in certain spaces, if we set out as for a series of discussions, uh, for the first three discussions, we didn't even invite any local leaders or uh, local politicians to the discussion because we didn't want uh, a political agenda to overtake the community's voice. And that takes a long time to really develop the, the capacity to be comfortable in saying, hey, we, we appreciate you wanting to support the community, but this is not a discussion for you. Uh, the way you support the community right here is at this point you sit you sit out um, and you allow the community to develop their own voice and, and talk about their experiences and what's been great about this is hearing people just come and walk in their truth and saying things that they may not have been comfortable saying depending on what voice was or was not in the room mm -hmm. being intentional being intentional 
and Jed as a uh, experience with as a funder, how do you get that buy-in from leadership when you want to actually fund these types of strategies? Yeah, so I think a lot of it is taking the lead from the from the community as much as possible. I, I try to, if I'm going to be in spaces from a point of privilege, not only uh, from race, gender, uh, geographic class, potential privilege, uh, but as a funder in the room, uh, as much as possible being on the listening side, but then also realizing that, again, on the translation piece, going back into my organization and being uh, very um, uh, specific and, 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 and as much as possible um, thinking about what it means to be, if I'm a place-based funder, if I'm working um, you know, in Mississippi where I worked for, for many, many years, uh, having deep and long relationships. And what does that mean when as an as a employee of an organization uh, whose role, my role is to move money. My role is to move money to support community. And so it's up to me to do the hard work. It shouldn't be up to the, uh, to the community to do the hard work um, in terms of getting the money, right? Um, and so whatever it takes, if it means bringing partners from the community into the funder space to talk through ideas, talk through strategies, if it means um, bringing in other funders who, who might have whatever kind of expertise, if it means, um, uh, you know, getting into trouble every once in a while uh, within the within the workspace to say, you know what, like this is why this was important. You know, uh, I don't like using the term risk. I think that's kind of it falls into kind of a, a white supremacist patriarchal kind of mindset that you know, uh, putting dollars out into particularly communities of color and disenfranchised communities is somehow a risk. So, like, how do I translate that into like the funder space and say, you know what, like this is what we got to do and this is why and this is also what our communities that we say we're working for are demanding of us so um i think those i i don't really i never got the sense that there was like real internal resistance i think it was always a question of well what are the outcomes what are the outputs right and so like mm -hmm. having to manage those conversations and like really really like come prepared like put together you know as funders were always you know we usually put together uh memos or research or whatever it is on the investments that we want to make and so uh thinking about how to utilize those those points of power within an organization to kind of push and also get your allies in, internally as well because sometimes that helps um do some more organizing internally right doc so um that that's an important piece of the work as well Awesome. What I love about what both of you are sharing is that, hey, you have to be willing to do things differently, stepping outside of those comfort zones, being willing to say no to those that are not willing to, to hear no or not used to hearing no, and then being a little creative, being creative when trying to get the buy-in of those within our organizations. Thank you so much for that. Um, so to this point, we've talked about power, what it is, what do we mean when we say power um, in this space and power building in this space and um, on the spectrum of community engagement, the, the, the areas that we're focused on for this uh, portion of the conversation. And now we really want to discuss what are strategies of power building? And one of those strategies are transform well, is transformative community engagement. Um, and I will just hand that one over to the expert on this panel, uh, my colleagues, and when I learned a lot from David Chavez here, that's going to chat with us about that. Great. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And um, I really appreciate the, uh, to Will and Jed the comments and, and everyone else's comments coming up on the Menti board. I think we are keeping it real, and I appreciate that this is really complicated. You know, this is, uh, it's about the journey, as the point that it's, it's a journey, this shift. It's not uh, uh, the journey is the destination, this process of building community power, and that um, it's new. And so the capacity is really important and there are risks involved. Uh, so it's not easy. And I think one of the challenges that we face is it's not a program either. It's a movement. You can't treat it like another funding program. And that we'll get into more. So I want to comment on that. And one question that was raised is where do we get those three areas? It's pretty consistent throughout the literature in our experience. Those are the three strategies. We picked it up from all the different ladders. 
that are out there. And um, what we're finding is, and that there's a theme here, is that we kind of confuse and make these big terms out there to confuse and that doesn't advance power, it keeps power. So we're really trying to keep it not only real, but also keeping it simple. And so that's where those three buckets, those three strategies came from. It's pretty consistent with what's out there. Obviously, there's other things you can do and other parts of that to break it down, but that's really where we see where power, how is power? We have to look at where, who has power. People who have power understand it and know how to use it, and that's how they do it, by even having control, sharing it, or getting themselves in the right positions and developing the right relationships. So transformative community engagement is just a way of us begin to think about those higher end community engagement. So much of the requests we get for evaluation strategy is community engagement, it's those lower levels. Can we get more input? Our focus is not there. Everyone's doing that. What we wanna do is focus on where power shifts. So what we're calling transformative community engagement at the risk of having another acronym and another term to throw around is the practice of creating pathways to equitable power distribution by shifting greater power and control to communities over the decisions that affect their lives. Community members co-create and co-own the strategies and solutions. And we say this again, because this is not about how to do community organizing, but how to support community change and power shifting for those who are not directly involved and doing the work in those communities. So that's how we're defining it for today. With that, we have to understand, as I said, it's a larger movement, it's a larger thing. So just looking at an individual program, what we find in our work in Fresno and Schenectady and other places where we're helping develop the infrastructure for transformative community engagement. What are those things in place so that we can begin to mobilize a whole city, not just a couple of groups isolated around a specific issue for a limited amount of time? But how do you, like any other infrastructure, develop that ecosystem or or uh, infrastructure to be able to support community engagement. That in infrastructure, basically, as we look at the whole picture of a community, involves three major groups. Organizations that engage community members, government agencies, foundations, schools that are in that shared power mode. There are those community led groups, um, lock and neighborhood association, advocacy groups, mutual aid groups, faith based groups and others mentioned there, where people come together usually on their own with their own leadership who represent them. And they are community controlled uh, groups that work there. And that's where a lot of, uh, where we're seeing in cities where there are these intermediary organizations that support them. Anywhere from New York City where they support thousands of them to other cities that also have the training, technical assistance, and capacity building support as well as seed grants and other ways to be able to nurture the grassroots um, that, um, that we're seeing around the, the, the country. And we'll be doing another webinar in, in June that really reflects on, on the support system for grassroots groups in the uh, US as a study we just completed. Um, but in this case, we're looking at those intermediary organizations that play a critical role local universities, nonprofits, mayor's offices that support community engagement, as well as the work that like Jed and others have been talking about through foundations. So that is our ecosystem. Jasmine? Thank and you. Should, and if I could just say something that this, and I really emphasize this, I want to emphasize that this is, in order to take this on, not only, and I thought the questions were great, but you have to look at the whole picture of your community. I think that is a really important part. Yeah. It has to be a change in culture so that there's a culture of transformative community engagement that we also focus on when you begin to looking at supporting power building strategies. And that's why having the big picture and ecosystem becomes really, um, uh, really important. So now, thank you. Sorry, Jasmine, for that little extra plug. All right, so to this point, we've examined what power is and the three components of those things. And we've also taken a look at, you know, one strategy, which is transformative community engagement. It is not the way, it is a way, it is a strategy uh, that we want to share with you today. But how can you specifically support a power building strategy like one similar to transformative community engagement, which uh, David uh, just spoke about. So thinking about that, um, we're going to take you to the table. 
um, the equity and social justice table here. And there are multiple seats here around the justice table, equity and social justice table. But I would like for you to focus your attention on the left side of the table, because in our experience, this is where many are likely to become stuck um, in these particular pl um, places. So just a couple of things I would like to highlight is first, remember your why. Why are you in this in the first place? Why are you choosing to embark on a power building strategy um, for your community, for um, inside of your work? So in remembering your why, hold yourself accountable to that why. Um, is there someone that you can dedicate inside your organization? But the best way to remember your why is through that power sharing and pow that the power that the community has um, so that you have there's a feedback loop of the work that you're doing and so that there's accountability, there's an accountability measure there between you as an organization, whether you're a government agency, nonprofit or a, a funder, a philanthropy that can hold you accountable to that. Next, hey. David mentioned it and said it very clearly. This is not a program. This is a movement. This is an initiative. And anytime there is power on the table, there will be conflict. So be prepared to ad address and manage any conflict that arises because of this power building work in your community. Um, again, when power is on the table, there will be resistance. It is a natural response for us as human beings to react in that way. Um, so I just to keep it real, as David put it earlier, um, there will be pushback. You will be met with resistance. How can you prepare for it? Um, David mentioned earlier in the, the ecosystem of transformative community engagement, what intermediaries are you working with um, inside of this work that can communicate things that you cannot necessarily communicate, especially though uh, your views of maybe, maybe you're a funder or you're a government agency and you can't necessarily say some things, but those intermediaries can. So arm yourself and prepare yourself, be active uh, when you're embarking on such a strategy. Um, the another thing I would like to highlight is invest in capacity building. If you're a funder or an organiz, uh, uh, another type of organ, government agency, but if you're a nonprofit organization, take advantage of the capacity building services that are offered to you um, in this way. Again, the big thing, and we've heard it as far as challenges, we see we saw it in Mentimeter is like, what are the outputs? What are the outputs? Where where is my return on the investment? And um, really taking advantage of capacity, any capacity building services that are offered and um, recognizing the power and the utility of evaluation could be very useful when it's, when it's time to make the case for a power building strategy in the communities in which you're um, serving and that you would like to take this, uh, embark on this power building strategy for your work. But what, like there are things that you should be doing, there are also things that we need to stay away from. David, I'm sorry, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I want to jump in because yeah. go one back. thing that's really important, if we just go back for a second, I just don't want to lose uh, one piece. One. Mm -hmm. it, got, it got switched on you, Jasmine. But the, uh, and that is, the, and I think at the heart of this, and I know it's a way of attention, is that you have to be the change you want to see in other systems and organizations. Yes. That's put on the right. It got moved on you, Jasmine. But oh, the, yes. Um, but the I think it's really important to realize that what we've seen is that you if you don't start there, you pay later and, and then your, your leadership becomes more embittered because they really run into a lot of conflicts. So that you really just need to start from the beginning is thinking about those um, changes that you have to be the kind of change you want to see in other systems and begin to start at home, which is a lot of work, or else you burn people out and create enough bitterness that the next you don't get another shot at it, and that that takes away from other community groups trying to organize. So I just want to emphasize that that's something that across the board we've learned with our clients and groups we're working with that try to support it is to be prepared. You have to kind of walk the walk yourself before you can really support this. And I know that's daunting, but it's really important. And the last thing I just want to pick on Will's point, which is pick up, which is to create those safe, brave, and curious spaces for everyone to work together. I thought that was a good point and, and we covered that. So sorry about that, Jasmine. Oh, no worries, no worries. But uh, thank you for not remembering, well, forgetting 
that because being the change that you want to see speaks back to what our panelists shared earlier will mentioned earlier hey you have to be authentic authentic in this process and people sense um inauthentic people <laughs> and so where will the buy-in come from if i do not believe what you're saying and so that this power building strategy and if you know if air quotes were ever so relevant here this power building strategy is just another community engagement strategy that is on the left side of that spectrum that we showed sh shared earlier that is very one-sided so thank you for that sure i, you know, I want to be clear because like, uh, everybody's into change except not us right we want everybody right. else to power, but not us and that's not going to work so right. we have to be part of the change awesome thank you so those are the things you should be doing, but there are some things that we need to stop doing at the same time. So if you are a funder, if you are a government agency, and let's be clear, be clear, do not, do not confuse your organization's role. Be clear where you stand within that ecosystem. Play your position as a, a coach once told me don't go outside of that okay so don't confuse your your position and um, your organization's role inside of this power building uh process um relating to that at the bottom try not to you you're not in control you do not control this process sit back relax and listen to community be led by community and we know that is it is hard and it is daunting but it is necessary because again once again this is a movement this is a strategy and we have to lean into it and so we're saying we're doing power building share the power that is the, that's the main thing to remember and take away from that um again if you are a, a funder um you know let's not uh create unnecessary competition among organizations by making new issue organizations because the organizations in the community doing the work are not necessarily um, palatable for your, your particular organization. I see Jed nodding there. He's like, yep, yep, that's it. <laughs> lean on the people that are already doing it and leverage that that is the way to definitely get that are that return on investment that you're putting back into the community they're already doing it let them continue provide the resources to continue to do it and do it well again because they already have that trust they already have that authentic relationship with community um the the next thing i want to highlight here is listen as a capacity builder as a uh a researcher as an evaluator, I get it. That evaluation, particularly in low-income communities of color, comes with some neg some negativity, right? Part of that is because community has not been in charge of their own story. They have not been at the table. And even realizing and just pausing, a seat at the table does not equal power, okay? That equals a checkbox saying that you did it but it does not equal power. It is nothing more than that position. And now you're, is very tokenistic um, in, in, in a way, right? So making sure that communities at the table, they're identifying the issues, but they're also advising what change can you expect to see along the way? So now community is in charge of this, their own story and the power building that is actually taking place. So do not underestimate the power of data um, collection and evaluation in this process. And David will chat with us a little uh, more about that later. And our last webinar in this series will uh, cover evaluation as well. The last thing I would like to add is do not allow your organization to become a political platform. Listen, power is a huge thing. Remember I said earlier, you will be met with resistance. It will be pushed back. Power is on the table. And if power is on the table and I want to share power, clearly someone is going to lose power, OK? And we, what we know about politics is politics is all about power. Do not become the sounding board for whatever political um, uh, issue is on the table at the time. Focus on what you're trying to do and the whole purpose of this in the first place and doing that. David, did you want to? Yeah, I want to add add one thing, uh, two things to this. One is I think it's an important point to, to differentiate 
one of the concerns that came up at the Mentimeter, which is that we're talking about politicians or elected officials taking over these processes, um, but that if you're going to be involved in change that promotes racial and other forms of equity, you're going to be appearing to be taking a political side. You are taking a political position. So there is no neutral in this. And I want to be very clear that that's one of the big challenges. It's And there's a difference for nonprofits. You can be pro an issue, but not legislation necessarily, but you can advocate for an issue. And that's often been the way that foundations and other groups have worked through intermediaries who do have that 501c4s and others that do that. Um, the other thing that I wanted um, just to mention was something that Jed said, and I want to emphasize that because I know there's a lot of you know, tensions because obviously not all of us are presidents of foundations or nonprofits, and so we have to work within. And I think I think one of the points that Jed made is that know what you can offer. Don't be all things. Just be very clear. Like I said, I, my job is to move money and be able to provide that. And I would say that most organizations have money, you have relationships, you have a lot of things that fit out and you can put people in decision-making positions. So know what you can do and really know thyself first and what role you can play and not try to extend it to beyond what you're really capable of is a really important lesson. I appreciate that Jed raised that. It's really understanding what you can do and what you can't and finding those who can do what you can't. So in thinking about those things, what role do you see your organization playing in supporting um, community power building, power shifting? Um, what kind of support can your organization offer to a community building effort that will have the biggest impact on the success of this effort? What are those things? Um, but while you all are engaging there, and I just want to acknowledge one of the comments that I saw in the chat, we can share the outputs from Mentimeter um, following the series. We can put that together. Um, but to our panelists, um, while people are engaging, um, how did you see the role of your organization? Um, and I'm just gonna point this first question to uh, Jed. What, you know, in this a power building, a power shifting effort strategy, I know you said as a funder, um, and what kind of supports could you provide inside of that? Yeah, thanks. Um, so one of the first things that I did when I inherited a portfolio in my, my first philanthropic job was to work with my colleagues to do a deep dive examination of like, okay, we said we are an organization focused on racial equity. What does that mean? Not just what grants we're making, but like who are our vendors? Who are we working with? What other kind of like power and resources are we distributing, right? Um, I looked at the portfolio I got and thought about, you know, a couple of years out that a lot of the organizations were um, like universities or government agencies, mostly white led in Mississippi. That also means a lot of perpetu perpetuation of the, the same kind of extraction, uh, sorry, uh, same kind of extraction um, and uh, uh, issues that had been perpetuated for a long, long time here. Uh, and so I first worked on the portfolio. Um, the, the Choctaw weren't getting any support. The Vietnamese community down on the coast wasn't getting any support. Our immigrant community wasn't getting any, any support. A uh, few of the organizations that I received were led by Black women in, in our state. Um, and so the first thing was to do is to start shifting the organizations we were supporting, uh, at least through my portfolio. Uh, and then the second thing was to uh, then start translating that into, okay, how are they talking about power and really kind of communicating that um, in terms of the kind of issues. Uh, and then also very specific to communities, um, like going even deeper when they're talking about, we need more uh, multi-year discretionary, um, non-discretionary fund, general operating support funds, um, how to start using that within the strategy, right? Uh, I think about uh, the, a very rural, predominantly black community in the Delta that I worked with that had a vision. They had a very clear vision. They had put it together. They just needed the resources. They needed flexible support. They needed a little bit of help dealing with like government entities. Um, and so like uh, 
what I had to do was again, that kind of internal organizing to get all the pieces together and also make sure that we were in a position that we could also be held accountable by that community too, um, which was also part of the process was very tough conversations where sometimes we were called out about like, you say you're about racial equity, but you know, the, you didn't do this thing or that thing. It's like, oh, they're so right. But like, you can't really say that. So you have to like go and deal with it internally and figure out what kind of pieces need to change and shift. And so I think that's, um, uh, uh, being present and uh, being transparent and as possible and, and accountable to the communities that we're serving. Thank you so much for that, Jed. I just want to acknowledge where we are on time, a little transparent facilitation here. We're at 2.47. We do want to respect everyone's time. Um, I do want to also, uh, before we move forward, I just want to check in uh, with Will um, to ask, is there anything that you would do differently um, with the power building strategy that you use in order to establish that that police review board, the hiring review board that you that you and the community led? Um, no, I, I would say I like where we are a year into the process. A totally community owned and controlled and operated panel that has uh, to this date we have interviewed over twenty four officers, potential officers in the city of Schenectady, and the last. Uh, 15 officers that have been hired in the city's connectivity have been reviewed and recommended by myself and my other panel members. Um, to get to that point, the most thing that the thing that was important was um, understanding what authentic leadership looked like and accepting the role that it came with. Mm. That was that was tough because that it's internal. Because the thing is, is it's very easy for us from the community to look outside and want to hold others accountable. But the thing is, is accountability starts with us in the community first, uh, living up to the standards that we set. We don't need no saviors. My community, the communities across the nation, we are not broken. We are resilient. There have been, I always identify, and, and I'm very specific in saying this to people, my enemy is not a person, it's a structure, it's a system, it's systemic approaches, it's systemic thinking. It's these archaic systems that have been in place and have not been beneficial to a portion of people forever. So when we start to have these conversations about the system is broken, no, it's not. It's working perfectly fine to benefit who it's supposed to. And the thing is, we as a community have to be accountable and stop waiting for a handout. Nobody's dropping a check out the sky. It's not, so we have to rely, and I tell people this all the time, I bet on my community and the work that we do at all times, because my community has shown that it is we are transitioning from survival mode to thriving mode, starting businesses, creating equity, taking po uh, political positions, and, and our voices have been established. The work is monumental, and again, it's about a movement, not it's no longer about a moment. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Could not say it better myself, and you're getting a lot of love in the chat. I just see a lot of emojis there, so all good. Thank you, Will. Um, again, being very respectful of everyone's time, um, evaluation and telling this story about what happened, what we learned is extremely important in this process. And again, we will go further into it later um, at our later session, uh, the last session in this series. But David, do you want to just give us a sneak peek of the importance of monitoring evaluation and learning when we talk about power building? Right. Well, thank you, Jasmine. I also want to thank Will, because in standard form, when you talk about evaluation, you come in the shadow of the great work and great leaders and great visionaries like Will, and then have to talk about how to measure it all. But I think it's really important. I, I also I just want to resonate on the fact that that accountability, as I'll talk about, um, is really critical and, and helping, as odd as it is, that part of our job is to help to support communities in making us accountable as well. That's the first step in this. And I think that's really important. And I also wanted to resonate a point that it's interesting how communities of color, especially those led by women and others are, are often think it's more dysfunctional and more problematic in giving them money, even though we know that the failures and foundations are with much larger institutions and not with the small nonprofits. It's kind of an odd part of it, but I'm glad people elevated that issue that we have to begin to educate and work internally as change agents. And one of the ways that we've been able to do that has been through the discussions that are created and the help of evaluation, evaluative thinking 
um, to be able to help them to get more specific and hone in on what the issues are. So for as preview to what we'll talk about in greater depth in two weeks, um, I just wanted to touch on what I think is the core issues and where people have gone, um, gotten led astray. So evaluation is an opportunity for shared power, that questions are co-determined, that the instruments and methods are co-designed and culturally responsive. And as everybody that's an evaluator or a funder evaluation knows, that takes more, that process takes more time and it often takes more resources, but that's where putting your money where your mouth is and walking the walk comes in very important. That monitoring evaluations are in service of advancing equity. I think that's really getting lost um, in our field right now that the purpose is all these other things. And yet it's really the question that we ask and that we hope others will ask is how does this advance change? How can this be used to advance change rather than just describing what's going on? Um, and how can it be used? And that's gonna take both creativity and fortitude. Um, the, we need to be very conscious of the benefit to community organizations participants need to exceed its burden. We'll hear a lot about burden, burden of evaluation, burden of data collection. That has a lot to do because people don't see the benefits of it and we don't really return that to the community. We take this resource and use it internally and, um, and not really share those benefits with, with the community groups, the leaders who put actually whose resources we're using. So it's really important to begin to think about those things and we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, in the full sections, and that findings are shared with every are shared, and everything is transparent. That's really critical to this process. So many times we don't want to bother people with the sausage making, but they there are ways to be able to communicate this so people feel fully informed, and that we we have to be able to you know to share that information because as I said earlier, this is a resource we've taken from the community, and yet we gotta hide it behind the foundation or nonprofit's walls, and this that's not in the spirit of what we're trying to do here. So those are a couple of lessons of, of all the different models in the evaluation fields. Those are my five bullet, our five bullets of how to sum up all the different empowerment, equitable, collaborative evaluation theories. Next. I'm going to focus here on three points. I, one of the things that's come up in evaluation field and, uh, and its academic roots is that you take any complicated, any, any, any situation and make it more complicated and come up with 15 to 20 different varieties of how to define it. We're not only keeping it simple, but we want to keep it real. Um, the process there really, we, there's more to talk about, um, but that basically we see three basic components for measuring power building in some of the sample indicators. First is the process of gaining power. Things like active, the number of active me members, the community leadership, development activities that are going on, engaging allies and champions, um, how communications with residents are done in order to educate them on issues or to mobilize them and to get them engaged. You know, for example, we've studied the importance of what roles in some communities, the internet and social media plays an important role in terms of getting people involved, but learning about issues people rely more on their, their, their cultural or other traditional media sources. So that's really important to understand how those, the effectiveness, the capacity to use those communications to change the narrative is one of the things you can begin to look at as well as how to gauge people in mobilizing to take action. The second thrive is as you begin to gain power and develop it, how do you exercise it? It's a linear model just for discussion sake, but they're all interactive. Um, and that we found that in groups that are most effective have a commonly understood organizing model. How are they coming together and how are they gonna make change? What are the strategies? Um, is something that among the staff of organizers, their leadership, as well as their members in the community, you know, needs to have some sort of commonly understood approach in how they exercise their power. Um, that they have a, a developed plan that's adaptive as well, and that they've identified a series of targeted collective actions that they're going to be taking. And finally, and I think the most important to focus on today is the notion of what having power, what power is. It goes back to the Martin Luther King Jr. Um, quote, which is that getting what you want. You know, there's a lot of theories, a lot of different models. People have written like, 50, you know, again, several different types of power. But the ultimate expression of power is when a community comes together, identifies what they want and when they get that. And so we use things like goal attainment scaling and other methods, both qualitative and quantitative, to be able to say, this is what folks set out to do. This is where they end up, ended up getting. 
in that process, which does take time. There are incremental steps, but that basically, if you get, if the community sits down and gets what they want, then they have power. And if they don't, they don't. Um, so the degree to which those changes were achieved is a critical indicator. The representation of communities in positions of power have that has that changed over time, to the, as well as uh, the relationships with larger institutions. And do major institutions recognize that community leadership must be engaged in shared and decision making? Is that kind of power shifting institutionalized? Does your community organization, does Will's organization be the go-to place when dealing with police issues in the city of Schenectady or in the county? Okay. Those are some of the main components of, um, uh, of having power that we can talk about more. There is another component as far as looking at environmental conditions and capacity building that we'll talk more about later. But for time's sake, I wanted to give, we want to give everyone an overview of these components and kind of keep it both real and simple because we can have this thing to make it so complicated. It's not interpretable and usable um, as well. So um, with that, Thank you, I'll turn it back over to you, Jasmine. Thank you, David. Um, I want to thank our esteemed, experienced panelists for joining us for today's conversation and sharing your experiences. Um, I want to thank everyone who registered for our, our session today and attended. Thank you so much. And as a reminder, today's conversation is recorded and will be shared um, at the uh, conclusion of our session. We will also share the slides um, and we will also share additional information on our panelists as well. We, we did see some questions in the chat uh, specifically to uh, certain panelists. And uh, we will address your comments and questions in Mentimeter and follow up with FAQs. So with all of that being said, until next time, and remember our session next week, we'll see you next Thursday. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jasmine and Dante.